Right. Well, good morning, Christchurch Howick. Good to see you all. And I had one good morning coming back. So well done. <laughs> good to see you all uh, this morning. We've already had a service uh, at eight o'clock. So don't forget that. If ever um, you're up earlier than usual, um, come along to our eight o'clock service. Or if that might suit someone that you know, tell them about it. Uh, my name is Andy Pike. Um, I'll be hosting this morning as well as bringing us God's word a little later. I'm the rector here at Christchurch Howick. And uh, we must remember that we also have another congregation online. So welcome to those who are on the on Zoom and on YouTube. Um, I trust that today would be a, a blessing for you. If you are on Zoom and YouTube, we'll be having communion a little bit later. Um, and so at home, once you get something ready that you can eat, something that you can drink, um, we've got bread and grape juice here, but as long as it's something edible and drinkable, really, it's what it symbolizes that is most important. Well, uh, oh, and check your cell phones. Um, mine started ringing in the earlier service, can you believe it? Um, unforgivable sin. So check your, check your cell phones uh, as we look at this verse from uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians, a very fitting uh, passage for our time of year that we're entering but when the set time had fully come, in other words, at exactly the right time, at exactly the right time, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Amazing. God becomes a human being. That's what we remember every Christmas. He comes and he lives under the law. He lives out the law on our behalf. He lives the perfect life obedience to the law, so that we can be adopted into God's family, not just forgiven, but adopted and given full rights as children, um, uh, sons and daughters of the living God. Absolutely amazing. We're going to stand and remember exactly that in song now, as we uh, sing these words to one another. Uh, o come, O come, Emmanuel, as we remember what Christ has done for us. Let's stand and sing together. Thank you. Take a seat. Well, he who was to come to Israel came to Israel and came to the whole world, didn't he, uh, to take on the punishment of the world. Well, friends, just a couple of things to be bring to your attention. Actually, quite a few things. It's a busy, busy time of the year. Just a reminder that next Sunday evening is our carol service. 
Uh, it begins with a church picnic at five o'clock. So if you would like to come and join us for a bring and share picnic, do that next Sunday, five o'clock. And at six o'clock, we'll start with our carol service. So in case you wanted to come for just for that, aim at six o'clock. There'll be lots of activities for kids. Um, so uh, invite the neighbor's kids, bring them along, uh, spread the word to come to our carol service next week. And then on Christmas Day, there's only one service at nine o'clock. Uh, so um, just bear in mind the change of time there. And after uh, that service, we'll be having mince pies and tea and coffee together. Uh, so bring along a couple of mince pies that we can share uh, together, if you don't mind. And then Christmas Day lunch, um, Jacques is organizing a bring and bra here. So if you don't have plans, uh, come along to that. We do need names and numbers. So there's a list on the table out there, if you'd like to put your name on that, so that we can have the right number of, of bras going. Come to that. And then we've already had about, I think, 18, 19 kids signed up for our holiday club, which is really good going. Uh, the kids are still at school, actually. So that runs on the 20th, 21st, 22nd of December, the last week before Christmas. Um, and we need lots of helpers uh, for that. So there's, this list will be out on the table. And uh, if you can help in any way, uh, put your name on the list. Um, there's all sorts that needs to be doing from actually running a little group of I don't know, eight or nine kids, uh, to providing muffins and cupcakes for them for their morning tea, to providing lunches for the leaders afterwards, um, uh, kitchen duty, there's all sorts that uh, you can help with. So put your name down on the list, which will be on the table out there. And then we're busy getting our rosters together for the first quarter of 23. So if you'd like to start serving on the roster in any way, um, do chat to myself or Mara, during the week. Um, we'd love to include you on our reading uh, roster or um, uh, welcoming roster. There's lots of different duties that take place on a Sunday. Uh, kitchen duty, uh, do chat to me. If, also, if you know your unavailability dates in that first quarter, if you know you're going to be away, let us know so that we can uh, factor that in and not put you on when you won't be here. Okay. And then it's the Amberfield service, um, actually every week, but this week it's our church's turn to host that. And so if you're at Amberfield or know someone there, let them know to come along to the chapel on Wednesday at 11 for the Amberfield service. And then this week is the last week of midweek meetings. So just bear that in mind. Most meetings are carrying on as normal this week, uh, but they'll come to an end um, on Friday as things quieten down a little bit uh, as people go away towards Christmas. And then um, just a reminder that we launched a new project, a Memorial Bench Project. If you're interested in um, getting something in memory of a loved one, he has an opportunity, he has one option for you. There's uh, four different types of garden furniture that we've highlighted from a catalog uh, made of recycled uh, plastic, pretty much indestructible. Um, and uh, so have a look at that. If you'd like to, to get something, there will be a plaque made. Um, I never know if it's plaque or plaque. I think plaque is what you get on your teeth, isn't it? Uh, get, get a plaque made. It'll be that size. Uh, so that's the plaque in real, in real size. And your uh, wording of your, own, of your own choosing will be on that. Uh, but have a look and see what options are there. A couple of, in a couple of cases, families have gone in together to buy one item between two or three families. So that's, that's another option to consider. And then once a month, we like to give you feedback on the finances. I'm afraid it's not great at, at the moment. So our October giving was really down for some reason, um, uh, very low. Uh, uh, it might be a matter of timing, uh, end of the month versus when uh, the reports were generated. Uh, but the whole year we've been tracking pretty much on par but at the moment, as you can see, we we in the red by about 36,000 Rand. And that's without any provision for uh, bonuses for any of the staff. So just, uh, I'll leave that with you, ask you to commit that to your prayers. I'm going to ask the stewards if they will take up uh, the collection now, um, as we uh, really give back to God from what he has given us, from what is already his, um, as we seek to grow the work of the gospel here from Christchurch. Thank you very much. Let's bow on a word of prayer. 
But Father, it is true that everything that we have belongs to you. Um, it is in our care for a few years, and we thank you that out of your generosity to us, we can afford to be generous to you and to your gospel. And so please, Lord, will you help those who administer this money to do so wisely and for the extension of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, we come to a time of communion uh, now. Um, if you're online, this is where you get your bread or your biscuits and uh, your juice. Um, it is a time to remember what God has done. We do that in song. We do that when we have the Bible read. We do that during the sermons. But communion is special because we do that by eating and drinking, by participating is, is the language that the New Testament uses, participating uh, in what Christ came to do. Um, the, the bread is, is not special. It's not holy. It's not sacred. It's just bread. But it reminds us, doesn't it? It reminds us of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fact that God took on flesh and that that body was broken for us on the cross. And, and the grape juice, likewise, um, it symbolizes the blood of Christ shed for us that we might be forgiven. And so communion uh, is for people who need forgiveness. If we didn't need forgiveness, Christ wouldn't have needed to have come. And so communion is for people like us who are sinners, but it is for people who are trusting in Christ, who are not content just to uh, carry on in their sin, but who are trusting in Christ and have had their sins forgiven. And so we're going to say the Apostles' Creed together, which is a great litmus test of what we believe. It's, uh, it's the test against which we can, uh, we can judge our own beliefs. And so let's say the, the Apostles' Creed together. And as we do so, let's just think about whether what we believe lines up with what uh, the Bible teaches. Join me. I believe in one God, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in the Father Almighty. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, he died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, Christ's holy universal church, the fellowship of Christians, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen, indeed. Those are the nuts and bolts, if you like, of the, of the Christian faith. And if that's what you believe, you're very welcome to join us in communion uh, this morning. As we do so, let's just remember how unworthy we are, that we don't deserve this great kindness that God has shown us of giving us eternal life. Let's pray this together. Merciful Lord, we do not dare to come to your table trusting in our own righteousness, but only in your great mercy. Without your gracious forgiveness, we are not fit to gather up the crumbs under your table. But the finished work of redemption by your dear Son, Jesus Christ, has made us fit to be welcome in your presence. Grant, therefore, that as we eat and drink, we may by faith remember the bloody and the blood of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. We ask that as we do this, we may be united to him and him to us. And I'm going to ask the stewards to come and distribute first the bread. We'll eat together, uh, and then the, we'll drink together after that. <clears throat> well, on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you. Feed on him in your heart by faith and with much thanksgiving. Let's eat together. Well, you'll be served the cup now by the stewards. Thank you. Well, at the last supper, after they had finished eating, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. So drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be very, very thankful. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we bring you praise and thanksgiving and ourselves, our souls and bodies to be a lifelong offering to you. Lord, accept this duty and service we owe you, not because we deserve it, but because of Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name alone we come to you. Amen. Well, as the stewards uh, collect the little uh, cups, let, let me remind you of the little care fund box at the door. Uh, that's a special collection we take uh, on communion Sundays uh, to help families in our church who fall on hard times. So just remember that as you leave. All right, I'm going to ask Liz to come forward. She's going to be leading us in prayer this morning. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I thought that as today is the second Sunday in Advent, we would pray together the collect. Blessed Lord, you've caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant us to so hear them, read, mark, learn, and speak, so that encouraged by the divine holy we may class. And not think the joyful hope of everlasting life which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. John writes in his gospel in the first chapter The Word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus became flesh and lived among us and that his glory was revealed. Thank you for sending Jesus, your only son, as a man. And thank you that he humbled himself to be a sin offering for us, providing the way for us to become your children. We remember with awe and gratitude that Jesus, Messiah, the Christ, was born in fulfillment of the promises made to the people of Israel. He alone is wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. We thank you for the gospel and eyewitness accounts that show us that in him the fullness of God dwells and that through him alone, we have been reconciled to God because of his death on the cross. Lord, you are the way, the truth, and the life, and you've entrusted us with the gospel. We confess that at times we've been distracted, complacent, and focused on our own comfort. We pray that the light of the Lord will shine through us in this season. Grant us compassion for those around us who do not know you and wisdom as we look for opportunities to share our faith that Jesus is Lord and Savior, especially with those we love. Lord Jesus, you are our hope and by your spirit may we always be enabled to give a reason for the hope that we have with gentleness. Thank you for those who serve you as ministers in REACH, SA, and also wherever the gospel is preached. We thank you that the gospel is proclaimed faithfully and clearly at Christchurch, Howick. Please bless Andy, Richard, <clears throat> John, and Douglas and their families, and all those who support them on the staff and in the council. Lord, we thank you for their example. Please fill us with compassion for those who are struggling with illness, loneliness, anxiety, and change. May we reach out with comfort and support to those near us, and please help them in their difficult situations. We pray especially for those who serve you in war-torn countries and in places that are intolerant of the gospel. Please protect your people there. Heavenly Father, our country is going through a period of confusion and distress. We ask you, Lord, 
to bring peace and steadiness at this time. May people of wisdom and integrity come to the fore to help our country go forward in peace. We pray for the missionaries with support. So many of them work with students who will be going home during the holidays. Please protect them and keep them faithful to the Lord they have confessed. Father, as we enter the season of rejoicing and the miracle of the first coming of our Lord Jesus to the world, we pray that the wonder of it will fill our hearts again and that we will look forward to his return in power and glory. May we be those who prepare and look forward to his return and use this time of grace to be busy for your kingdom. And we ask all this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, friends, let's stand and sing uh, again how deep the Father's love for us. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he would give his only son. To make a wretch's treasure I'll pay the pain of searing loss The Father turns his face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there. Was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in. Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. This I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. Thank you. Why don't you take a seat? Well, friends, if you've got a Bible or a Bible app on your phone, please open it to Ephesians and chapter 4. Uh, we're picking up the second half of that chapter this morning. Ephesians is a letter written to Christian believers in the ancient city of Ephesus, a home of a quarter of a million people in its heyday, the second largest city in the Roman Empire. So a very strategic uh, city for Paul to uh, take the gospel to, and he did. He spent two years there. Uh, such was the importance of the city of Ephesus. Life in the city, though, was dominated by the worship of Artemis. Diana is her Roman equivalent, the goddess of fertility. She was probably the most worshipped deity in Europe and possibly the world in Paul's day. And her temple, a magnificent temple, one of the seven wonders of the world, was situated right there in Ephesus. Hundreds of eunuch priests and virgin priestesses and religious prostitutes were employed by the temple to work at the temple. And devotees came from all over the world to worship and celebrate Diana during the festivals held to honor her. Predictably, uh, the worship services were very erotic in, no in nature, involved animal sacrifices and temple prostitution, and that set the tone for life in the city 
of Ephesus. Imagine bringing up kids in a place like that. It was difficult to shock an Ephesian. But that's exactly what Paul is calling these Christians to do, to shock their friends and neighbors, and not through debauchery and promiscuity, but through self-restraint and honesty and kindness and their work ethic. It's true that these Christians had once been part of Ephesus. They had been united to Ephesus. But now, says Paul, he reminds them they are united to Christ. Not just part of Jesus' religion, but part of him. He was their new identity. They were in Christ, says Paul. That's a phrase he uses 33 times in this letter. In Christ, they'd been chosen from before the creation of the world. In Christ, they were now counted righteous. In Christ, their sins had been atoned for. They had been forgiven. In Christ, they had been raised from the dead and seated with Christ in, in heaven. And in Christ, they had been blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing that God has got to offer. Now the question is, how should people who are in Christ, how should they live? How should they treat each other? What should their private and their public lives look like? That's what Paul is going to be looking at in the rest of this chapter, and in fact, the rest of the book. So let's follow in our Bibles as we listen to God's word read for us um, by Steve. Um, and then I think Selwyn after that. Thanks, Steve. Okay, the first reading is from Ephesians chapter 4, and I'll be reading from verses 17 to 24. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you are no longer, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they're full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ, and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and we made new in the in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God, in true righteousness and holiness. Good morning, friends. We continue in Ephesians and through to chapter 5, verse 2. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Here in the reading. Did you notice what uh, life looked like for even people still uh, in this church in Ephesus? Uh, bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander. Uh, that describes um, what these Christians had been involved in and actually were still involved in. And hence, Paul says, get rid of it. Well, friends, 
cast your minds back to 1975. Uh, the hard rock band Aerosmith, remember them? Uh, released their smash hit Walk This Way. Walk This Way. I don't think they read their Bibles too much, so I don't think they got their title of their song from the book of Ephesians, but they could have, because Walk This Way is exactly what Paul is saying in our passage. Paul actually says walk wherever the NIV puts the word live. So in 4 verse 1, walk in a manner worthy of the calling you've received. 4.17, do not walk as the Gentiles walk. 5 verse 2, walk in love. 5.8, walk as children of the light. 5.14, be careful how you walk. So walk this way, says Paul. The way we are to walk as Christians is to keep putting off and putting on. Did you notice that repeated throughout our passage? That's what Paul's going to say to us today, to walk this way. And the first point he makes is don't walk in ignorance. Don't live in ignorance. He says, I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Notice Paul is not offering a bit of friendly advice here. He says, I tell you this, and I insist on it in the Lord. In other words, what he's about to say is not optional. You can't call yourself a Christian and then ignore what Paul is about to say. Unbelievers live the way they do, says Paul, because they are separated from God. Christians, on the other hand, are people who have been united to God. And that's why Paul has the right to call us to be different, to, to, to march to a different drum. Paul starts by describing what life looks like for people who haven't heard the gospel. He says, verse 19, having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. At the root of people's impurity and greed is what Paul calls ignorance. Now, he's not saying that they're stupid. It's just that we all start out in life being ignorant of God. No one starts, starts out in life knowing God and knowing his ways. And the problem wasn't a lack of religion. These people were very religious. You wouldn't have found a single atheist in the city of Ephesus. It's just that they were all worshipping gods of their own making, gods made in their own image. In this case, a god in the form of a young woman who demanded to be worshipped through sacrifices and sexual intercourse with temple prostitutes. Worship, I might add, that the Ephesians were only too happy to provide her. So Paul says to these Christians, that's what you once were. You were ignorant. But you are ignorant no longer because now you have the truth about God because you have been taught the gospel. And friends, let's not blame God for our ignorance. Ignorance of the law is never a defense in the court of law. Paul says that we are ignorant of God because, verse 18, the ignorance that is in us is due to the hardening of our hearts. Our ignorance is our own doing. We've all chosen to live in ignorance of God. We have no appetite for God, no heart for him. And so we choose to live our lives, says Paul, separated from God. Instead of worshiping their creator, these people in Ephesus had chosen rather to worship and serve created things. Bertrand Russell was a famous British mathematician, philosopher, pacifist, a, a, a leading intellectual in the world in his day and a leading atheist of his day as well. One day someone asked Bertrand Russell what he would say if he ever came face to face with the God that he didn't believe in. And his answer, he said, I would say to God, not enough evidence, God, not enough evidence. Well, friends, I don't think the Apostle Paul would agree with Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell wasn't ignorant of God because of a lack of evidence. He was ignorant of God by choice. We are surrounded by evidence for God, but we choose not to see it. And did you notice the word futility in verse 17? 
Giving yourself over to sensuality and greed and indulging in impurity is not just harmless fun. That lifestyle destroys our relationships with others and it eats away at us. And even if there is no God, Paul says that such a life is futile. It is a dead end. It promises much, but in the end, it delivers nothing but disappointment and regret and pain. And yet, even though we know where that life leads, we're still strangely attracted by it. So Paul says to these Christians, beware, beware. You might have turned your back on sensuality, greed, and impurity once, but the battle is far from over. We're never completely free from the pull and the futile ways of thinking. So the first thing Paul says is, do not live in ignorance anymore. Secondly, he says, take off the old and put on the new. The Ephesian Christians had been looking for satisfaction in all the wrong places, but everything changed for them the day that they learned Christ. Verse 20, Paul writes, that, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. What is Christ Church Howick? Have you ever wondered about this question? What has Christ Church Howick got to offer the world? It's a hurting world. It's a broken world. We, we can't fix unemployment here at Christ Church Howick. We can't sort out the housing problem or the energy crisis. But we can do the one thing that no one else can do. We can present people with the truth about Jesus, who he really is, and what he has done for us, and how he rescues people from the darkness and the futility of a life lived separate from God. God's solution to the darkness and futility in Ephesus was not to clamp down on the false worship of Artemis at her magnificent temple, or to introduce life orientation in schools to teach people, teach kids how to behave themselves, or even to ban the temple prostitution that was part of, of Diana worship. No, God is never satisfied with covering darkness with an elastoplast. God's solution is always to fix the problem, not to hide it. God's solution was to come in person to tackle the root of the problem, and so God became a man the man Jesus, and he lived the perfect life to satisfy his own law. And then he took the punishment for the sins of his people on himself, so that they will never have to answer for their rebellion. Learning Christ and understanding Christ is what makes a real and lasting difference to the lives of people. And that's what Christ Church Howick and every other gospel preaching church can offer the world. You might have noticed that I've been using the phrase learning Christ. That's what Paul literally says in verse 20. You learned Christ. It's a strange expression, isn't it? It's one that you won't find anywhere else in the Bible. And in fact, anywhere else in any ancient literature, learning Christ. How do you learn a person? But what Paul means is that when you hear the gospel, you're not just learning about Christ. You are learning him. To learn Christ is to accept Christ and to submit to his rule over the world. It is to be shaped by him and to start imitating him. Coming to faith in Jesus is not about changing your religion. It's not a case of taking on new rules. Becoming a Christian is not so much an intellectual exercise as it is a relational exercise. It's about entering into a new relationship and taking a new person into your life and learning more and more about that person and learning what needs to change about your own person. Paul says in verse 17, now that you are united to Christ, now that you have learned Christ, you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. When you become a Christian, your identity changes overnight, but it takes the rest of your life for your behavior and your attitudes to catch up. And Paul uses this language of putting off and being renewed and then putting on to explain what he's talking about. Look again from verse 22. He says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which has been corrupted in its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and then to put on the new self, 
created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. The old self is what we left behind when we came to Jesus. It's the ignorance and the futility and the darkness that we've left behind. And in its place, God has given us a new self, a new person with new identity and new priorities and a new purpose for living. As verse 24 says, we are created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And between the putting off and the putting on, Paul says, there is the middle bit. There's the renewing of the attitude of your mind. The putting off and the putting on is what we do. But the renewing of the attitude of our minds is something that God does in the lives of his children. Something he does by his spirit. Something we are to submit to as he changes the way we think. Now, all that sounds fine in theory, but it's not so simple in practice. You see, the old clothes that we're told to put off are always going to be more comfortable than the new clothes that we are told to put on. It's like going back to our old clothes. We like going back to our old clothes, don't we? To keep putting them back on. And the daily putting off of the old clothes that we're comfortable with, that fit us so well, and the daily putting of on of the new clothes that feel stiff and tight and scratchy, well, that's a difficult process. Much easier to go back to hospice and buy back your old clothes again. But Paul says that having learned Christ, you have to put off the old self. Don't live by it anymore. You're a new person. Your identity has changed. It's like when you get married or when you, when you start working for a new company. Your identity changes. You can't carry on acting like a single man if you're married. You've got to start putting your clothes back on the cupboard, so I learned. Uh, you can't live as a single man anymore. It's entirely inappropriate. You need to start honoring your new relationship. You're not who you used to be. So too, when we come to God, if you become a Christian, you're no longer the same as the world that you once were part of. You've come out of that world now. So if I struggle with a short temper and get angry easily, it's not enough just to keep my anger under control, you know, to harbor it, but keep it under control. No, if I'm a child of God, I must put off my anger, but that's just the start. Then I must allow God to transform my thinking to see why anger is wrong. And then I need to put on love and patience and gentleness in the place of that anger. God doesn't just want to see anger management. He wants to see complete transformation so that we reflect him more and more and more. Put off, be renewed in your thinking, put on is the pattern that Paul follows. So what will this look like day to day in the classroom, at home, at work, here in the community that you belong to at Christchurch Howick? Well, Paul finishes off by giving us some great practical examples. He summarizes everything he's about to say right at the end in chapter 5. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The Christian's motivation for changing the way we live is not the fear of being caught or the threat of punishment. Our motivation is that we have been loved. Christ has loved us. He has given his life up for us. There's a great word to describe what Paul is saying here. It's the word that's fallen out of fashion, actually, but it's a great word I learned this week. Redomancy. I hope I pronounced it right. Redomancy. The act of loving the one who loves you. The act of loving in return is how it's defined. That's not, by the way, how God loves us. Doesn't wait for us to love him and then he, in return he loves us. No, he loves us unconditionally. But redomancy is what God is asking of his children for us to love him in return. When we see a sign, don't walk on the grass, we immediately think, why not? Why shouldn't I? Well, is that just me? But that's what I think. But when the God who died for us asks us not to walk on the grass, we should think he died for me. Why would I want to break his law? He loves me. Why wouldn't 
I stay off the grass if that's what he wants. If this is all he's asking in return, why shouldn't I be glad to comply? He loves me. Why wouldn't I love him in return? Now, you might have noticed the pattern that Paul follows through these examples. Put off, in other words, stop doing this. And put on, start doing this instead. And then the reason, the reason why we should make this change. And the first example comes in verse 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood, lies, and speak truthfully to your neighbor. Do that in the place of the lies. Why? For we are all members of one body. The reason Christians shouldn't lie to each other or to anyone for that matter is at the end, we are members of one body. That's the motivation. That's how our mind renewed by Christ thinks about the importance of truthfulness in relationships. Paul could have just quoted the ninth commandment, do not lie, but he doesn't. Hey? Rather, he, he says, speak the truth in the place of telling lies. Every day I must put off falsehood and put on truth in its place. It's a principle that Paul gets from the Old Testament, from a prophet called Zechariah, who says in chapter 8, speak the truth to each other and do not love to swear falsely. I hate all this, declares the Lord. You see, Zechariah looked forward and he saw a day coming when God would build a new community, a community who would speak the truth in the place of lies. And if you're a Christian here today, then you're the person Zechariah is talking about. As part of this Zechariah community, the body of Christ, any hurt I cause another part of the body is going to hurt the whole body. Anything I do against someone else in this community is a sin against the whole community. New community, says Paul, means new rules. And do not think that Christ will let you hurt another part of his body and get away with it. He will protect what is his. So I need to start being careful before I speak falsehood against another member of Christ's church. I am to make absolutely sure I've got my facts straight before I am critical of anyone. And even if I have got my facts straight, Jesus lays down very clear guidelines for us to follow in pointing out faults in other people. Matthew 18, John 8, 2 Corinthians 13, 1 Timothy 5. They're just some of the many places where, where, where we're given instructions of how to point out people's faults to them. I know that's not how things are done in our secular society, but we are no longer part of our secular society. We dare not do things the way we used to or the ways we want to, for that matter. Slander and gossip and libel are commonplace in Facebook and on, in the school car park, but they have absolutely no place in Christ's body, the church. When you become a Christian, the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to renew your thinking and help you see that you're part of Zechariah's new community that he saw coming, a community that Christ bought with his blood. Surely that's enough motivation for me to change my behavior and protect the relationships in my church. Well, Paul's next instruction is about anger, and it gets quicker now. Verse 26, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. That's a quotation from Psalm 4 in the Old Testament, and Paul literally says, be angry, but do not sin. In other words, anger itself is not a sin. There are times when it's appropriate to be angry, when we see injustice or when people are hurt or when Christians are persecuted. God gets angry. Jesus got angry. But the danger for Christian people, as Psalm 4 says, is that our anger might lead us to sin. And so Paul makes two helpful points to help us guard against sinning in our anger. He says in verse 26, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. In other words, understand the danger that your anger is posing to you. So deal with your anger promptly. If you need to take action about evil or injustice, do it. But do it according to Matthew 18, as I've said. Paul seems to think that the longer we hold on to our anger, 
the more likely it is that bitterness and resentment will grow. And the more likely it is that we will then start sinning. And so he says, secondly, verse 27, don't give the devil a foothold by letting your anger grow. Even legitimate anger can so easily be a foot in the door for Satan. Even legitimate anger can easily lead us into unkind words or ungodly thoughts. So says Paul, in your anger, do not sin. Then stealing, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer. That's the putting off. But they must work doing something useful with their hands. That's the putting on. So that they may have something to share with those in need. That's the motivation. Unwholesome talk, he says. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. That's the putting off. But that's but only what is useful for building others up according to their needs. That's the putting on. So that it may benefit those who listen. That's the motivation. Remember the word redomancy. Loving others and doing what is best for others because I have been loved. Say only what is helpful for building others up, says Paul. That's a challenge, isn't it? Can you imagine what the world would look like if we took just this one command seriously? And unwholesome talk is not just swear words and bad jokes. It's also careless words and unkind words. With our renewed minds, we are to ask ourselves, is what I am about to say helpful? Is what I am about to say, will it build the other person up? It takes conscious, intentional effort, doesn't it? And then grieving the Holy Spirit. Just as we are not to give the devil a foothold, so we must also not grieve the Holy Spirit. In other words, our actions and our words don't only affect others in the church. It also affects God, the Holy Spirit, who is sensitive to what we say and what we do. So don't grieve him, says Paul. He is not an impersonal, cold, dispassionate force. He can be saddened. He can be hurt. So guard your thoughts. Guard your tongues. Don't grieve him. And then Paul rounds, rounds off the list by dumping a whole lot of stuff together. Get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and brawling, love that word, and slander, along with every kind of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ in Christ God forgave you. On the one hand, get rid of all this stuff. On the other hand, replace it with kindness, compassion. Uh, forgiveness. In all these verses, Paul is simply saying, be like God, verse 24. Follow God's example, chapter 5, verse 1. In every area of life, we are to put off and put on because we have renewed minds. We know what it is to be loved. We know what it is to be forgiven. Just as in Christ, God forgave you, reminds Paul. Paul reminds these Christians. This, says Paul, is the way of love. This is what God expects from his children. Well, let me wrap up this morning. <clears throat> In 1975, Aerosmith sang that song, Walk This Way. But God has been saying that to his people for 2,000 years through the Apostle Paul. Walk this way, walk in love, follow God's example. Not in order to be saved, but because you have been saved, because you are saved. God's dearly loved children, because you are to follow God's example. Walk this way, because if you're a Christian, you're a new person with a renewed mind, worshiping a new God who has plugged you into a new community with a new way of doing things. Walk this way, because Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Walk this way, putting off the old self, using your renewed mind to put on the new self to be like God. Do that, live like that, and the world will be shocked. The world will sit up and take notice because that is not normal. That is not how normal people live. But I don't want to be disrespectful and just assume that everyone listening today is a Christian. Some of you might still be considering the claims of Christianity. So let me finish with a word to you. Firstly, thank you for being here today, whether you're here or online. Thank you for being open-minded enough to come and listen to what the Bible says before rejecting Jesus outright. 
However, I do need to point out that all this talk of imitating God and putting off your old self is frankly unfair. The challenge of this section for you is not to change how you live, but to change what you believe. The claim of this section is that Christ loved you, gave himself up for you as a sacrifice for your sins so that you might be forgiven. The challenge to you is to go home and decide what you're going to do with the information before you worry about putting away falsehood and not getting angry and not brawling anymore. Why not go home and start reading about this Jesus? Read Mark's gospel, John's gospel. They're great places to start. Keep coming back here to learn more about this Jesus. I think you'll find that beneficial as well. So let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you that we don't have to live in ignorance anymore. Thank you that we can know you by learning Christ and knowing Christ. Father, we are tired of living futile lives. Please help us as we seek to imitate you and to walk your way, putting off our old selves, putting on Christ. For we pray these things in his name. Amen. Let's stand and sing. I think you might have heard this song before somewhere. Hark the herald angels sing. Uh, glory to this newborn king. Let's stand and sing. Friends, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Don't forget the sign-up forms for Christmas lunch or for helping at the holiday club or wanting to get a memorial bench. Um, we wanted to put an order in for what we've got so, so far this week, so do come and chat to me about that. And as we go, let's just remember these words. It says, Paul, put off your old self, which has been corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and then to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. What wonderful challenge for us to take into the week um, this week. Uh, God bless. Do stay for a tea, cup of tea or coffee. There is load shedding at 11, if I'm not mistaken. So I think the kettles are boiled. Uh, let's grab a cup before the lights go out. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.